Scripture reading for today is Luke 5. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi. He was sitting in his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his home. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. There is so much that divides us in our nation, isn't there? And even as Christians, uh, between churches and denominations, there's much that separates us into different tribes. And yet we hold at least one thing in common. What, what would that be? Well, I think it's food, <laughs> right? It's eating together. Uh, it seems like every church that I've ever been to or, or ever looked into, they all say they have the best coffee, donuts, potlucks, noodle dinners, fish fries, right? And we all claim that, that, that is true. And, and you might have thought it was Jesus. Well, that, that too, yes. We, we do hold Jesus in common. But, but what did Jesus do in his lifetime? He ate with people all the time, right? Sinners and saints alike. This month, we're looking at the, the five habits of, of highly missional people, habits that if we cultivate them well into our day-to-day -day lives, our, our rhythms, will we'll surprise the world. And last week, we, we considered how we are to bless, encourage uh, strengthen others in the name of Christ through our words of affirmation, uh, acts of kindness, and gifts. And uh, speaking of, of blessing and, and gifts, I was, my world was surprised this week. Uh, I don't know if you noticed on social media, I was surprised by Dave Calabro from uh, WTHR and uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. He gifted me with an original chair from Bush Stadium here in Indy. Isn't that cool? I, I have not been that surprised, I think, in a long time. It was quite the blessing. But blessing is a way to simply encourage, strengthen, uh, to bless uh, another. And, and this week's uh, habit is really kind of an extension of, of the first, of that habit uh, of blessing. Because we can bless others by, uh, by eating with another, right? By, by inviting them to spend time with us, sitting down at the table, and, and looking at it as a way of, of being missional of a way of connecting with another person. And I've always known that to be true uh, as a pastor. I've always tried to find time to eat with and drink with, mostly coffee, uh, parishioners and, and neighbors and colleagues in the communities that I have been called to serve. Uh, when I served at Meridian Street United Methodist here in Indy, um, in Butler, Tarkington, I made this place my office away from the office, uh, Illinois Street Food Emporium. I had some office hours that I would hold there where some days there was nobody, other days maybe just one or two people would come, and then other days we'd have to pull tables together. People would introduce themselves from the same church and have conversation with one another. It was amazing the way we could connect with another people. Uh, when I served at First United Methodist Church in downtown South Bend, I made uh, a place called the South Blend, with an L, 
coffee company my office away from office. And now I nearly have probably a dozen or so coffee shops that I go to all the time. So what do they all have in common? I have an issue with coffee, perhaps. <laughs> but I've always seen the way sitting at the table having a cup of coffee or a sandwich or whatever can really uh, break down barriers with another person, right? Or you can simply have a conversation, a real conversation with, with another person. Every one of us eats daily, usually several times a day for most of us, right? Which means we're all pros at this second habit. It's not hard. It's simply eating with, drinking with, spending time with another person at the table. And again, it's just transforming what we do on a regular basis um, and looking at them with a little more intentionality about how we can use them for our faith and, and a way to, to share the love of Jesus Christ with others. And, and eating together is a formative activity. Sitting at a, a common table together for a meal or even a cup of coffee, we find opportunities for community-making and identity-forming practice. We make community and our identity is formed at the table. I've read that the average dinner time 60 years ago was how long? What would you guess? How long was the average dinner 60 years ago? So it was 90 minutes. 90, can you imagine that today? 90 minutes. So today the average time is what would you guess for a dinner? I heard 30, 15, 20, it's 12 minutes, 12 minutes. And I think we miss an opportunity, right, to, to make community, to, to, to really get to know another person, to form that identity with another as we just simply try to get dinner in and then we get back out into the world, right? We go back to our regular thing, our next thing. We miss an opportunity. And if we follow Jesus and, and want to be like Jesus, and let's look at our habits at the table and consider how we can surprise the world with our hospitality, our inclusivity, our, our generosity, our grace, our willingness to sit a little longer than 12 minutes at the table with another person. And the table has often been the centerpiece for community making and identity forming for people of faith. There are over 700 references in scripture to eating and drinking together. The Passover meal was, was significant, not just for physical nourishment for the people of God, but to remember for the spiritual nourishment, for, to remember what God had done in the life of the Jewish people. And when Jesus came, he also celebrated the Passover meal as an observant Jew of his time. But he also found other significant moments out of that religious meal to, to sit with another person, to sit with other people at the table. He blurred the lines, if you will, between secular and sacred at these simple meals, and the religious leaders didn't like it. They didn't understand it. Why do you eat and drink with, with those people, with, with tax collectors and sinners, they asked him. And after Jesus called his first disciples, after he healed and, and taught, he pronounced the forgiveness of sins. It was all getting under the, the Pharisees' skin. But then he had to go that far, where he would actually sit at the table with other people. The other stuff was all bad enough, but to associate with them, that was all too much. And so Levi, the, the tax collector, who Jesus had called with simple words, follow me, held this great banquet, a party for Jesus at his house. And if you notice, Jesus didn't say, sorry, I, I can't come. I have some sermons to preach. Nor did he say, okay, fine, I'll come to the party for 12 minutes and then I'm out. I have some ministry to do, right? He didn't say that. Instead, Jesus saw the opportunity, the, the very act of eating and drinking with, with the crowd as, as ministry, as, as a missional opportunity to connect with others. And I bet it was a meaningful gift, a, a blessing 
for Levi to receive and the gathering of tax collectors. Jesus came to the party. Jesus hung out with us. He he blessed us with his presence, his hospitality, his generosity, his inclusivity, his, his welcome and grace. And if that's what Jesus did, so can we. And for all of us, every time we gather in this place, what do we have as the centerpiece of our sanctuary? But, but the table, right? And even on those Sundays when we don't share in the meal of Holy Communion together, having the table up front and center is a reminder for all of us of that truth. Uh, to be people of generosity and, and grace and inclusivity, to, to bless others with our presence and our love. Author Peter Lethart in his book, uh, Blessed Are the Hungry, wrote, and uh, can you just read this quote with me? For Jesus, feast was not just a metaphor for the kingdom. As Jesus announced the feast of the kingdom, he also brought it into reality through his own feasting. Unlike many theologians, he did not come preaching an ideology, promoting ideas, or teaching moral maxims. He came teaching about the feast of the kingdom, and he came feasting in the kingdom. Jesus did not go around merely talking about eating and drinking. He went around eating and drinking a lot. A lot, right? We see Jesus doing that every town he goes to. Every chance he gets, he's at the table with another. Many significant moments happen around the table, right? We, we celebrate. We mourn. We grieve. We remember loved ones who are no longer at the table. We gather with family and friends. We pass the plate with fellow believers who are on the journey and maybe even people who don't agree with us politically. And yet we take the time to be intentional at the table, to share life in a meaningful way with others. And we'll have a shared memory and experience as we do. I'll never forget the shared meals that I've had in places like Incheon, South Korea where I, I sat at the table with these young uh, Methodist men who, who sat down on the floor. I was looking for the chairs, and they sat down on the floor, invited me to come and, and sit down with them, and they passed me the sashimi and kimchi. We didn't speak the same language, but we all laughed, and some of us cried as I tried the wasabi. Um, <laughs> a- apparently, you're supposed to use just a little, not the whole thing. There was the time I I sat down at the table with monks in Manila, the Philippines, and they sat down a whole fish in front of me, uh, scales and eyes looking at me. A pizza with my wife in Rome, uh, memory after memory of shared meals around a table. I'm sure you can think of some too, right? Uh, Maybe from your travels or or maybe holidays or or celebrations in your life. There's something meaningful about being at the table. That it is a place for for community making and identity forming. And rarely do you leave the same table feeling like you don't know that other person, right? That you shared a little bit of yourself with that other person. Even if that meal's 12 minutes, not that I'm encouraging that, but even if it was... I bet you could still get to know somebody that quickly. We hunger for physical nourishment. That's true. That's why we eat three times a day at least. But we also hunger for for social and and emotional connection, right? And a spiritual sustenance around the table. And if we think back for a moment of those locked down days of the pandemic, can, can you remember those days? It was one of the most difficult things in the world to not do what? to not sit down at the table, right? To not enjoy a meal with another person. We realized how much we missed that personal connection, especially during that time of lockdown. And I know for our family, and maybe it was the same for yours too, we celebrated Easter that year in 2020 by placing our cell phones against, uh, you know, cups or other things, uh, trying to see the faces of our loved ones who were in another town or city, uh, trying to be able to connect with them in some way. 
And, and it was necessary for the time, but it was still strange, right? It still felt different. It was missing that element of, of being together, of sitting at the same table. I love this quote from uh, Alan Hirsch, who shares, sharing meals together on a regular basis is one of the most sacred practices we can engage in as believers. Missional hospitality is a tremendous opportunity to extend the kingdom of God. We can literally eat our way into the kingdom of God. Talk about a spiritual discipline, right? If every Christian household regularly invited someone else, even a poor person, into their home or lives for a meal once a week, we would literally change the world by eating. And so here's the challenge this week. And you'll hear it again next Sunday in the discipleship moment because we like to follow up with these challenges, right? With these invitations. And it's not something really all that new because we've had it before as well. But just eat with somebody else this week. Someone not a member of the church, someone who is a member of the church, and that's, that's it. For those of you who are with us at the end of September for our last Good Politics conversation, uh, Reverend Josh Riddick, who was with us, if you remember, he challenged us at the end of that session to find somebody else and just have a cup of coffee, and that, that would count too for this, okay? But what he said was, uh, find somebody who looks reasonably friendly, <laughs> that, was, that was his invitation, and then just ask him to have co coffee with you. And, and so the invitation is the same for today. Before you leave, make an invitation to someone else to bless them with your presence this week. To simply eat with them, invite them to breakfast or lunch, and that will be a start for all of us to become highly missional people in our daily lives. You might find that when we invite someone to join us at the meal table for, for lunch or even coffee, you might surprise the world with that invitation. And, and I hate to quote a burger joint here, but the ad for rallies, you got to eat. You know that one? Well, it's true. You, you got to eat. So let's make it missional. So I'd like to close this morning using the words of uh, Brother David Stendhal Ross. Uh, if you're not familiar with Brother David, he's a 98-year-old author, scholar, and Benedictine monk from Vienna, Austria. Uh, he has taught for years about gratefulness and the act of blessing toward another person and, and how uh, gratefulness is the true and lasting source uh, of happiness. He's often called the grandfather of gratitude, quite the, quite the title there, don't you think? And he wrote this beautiful prayer called Giver of All Good Gifts. And so we're going to share um, this video of, of Brother David speaking aloud this prayer. He does have a, a thick Austrian accent. And so we'll listen to Brother David's voice. Uh, we'll hold just a moment of silence. And then I'll offer his prayer again, and I'll speak it for us. So let's hear the words of Brother David. Giver of all good gifts, you have spread out the world before us like a feast, like a table that is set by your motherly love. Open our hearts to feast at your table. to show our gratitude by remembering all those who have so much less than we have, by letting some of our own wealth overflow to them, by making those who are lonely while we have friends and company by making them less lonely, by being available for them. And 
Christians make the whole world one big joyful table fellowship. Eating together, singing together, dancing together, or in an overflowing of gratitude. giver of all good gifts. You have spread the world out before us like a feast, like a table that is set by your motherly love before us. Open our hearts to feast at your table, to show our gratitude by remembering all those who have so much less than we have, by letting some of our own wealth overflow to them, by making those who are lonely while we have friends and company, making them less lonely by being available for them and make the whole world one big joyful table fellowship, eating together, singing together, dancing together in an overflowing of gratitude. Amen. May it be in our lives this week and always. May we bless others with our presence. So friends, I invite you to stand as you are able and let us close by singing our praises to God.